Uh, just backing up a little bit uh, to the beginning of the, the section talking about the uh, Mit Render Zurge, uh, read from the pulpit on Palm Sunday of 1937, actually promulgated the previous Sunday, if you look at the actual date at which it was given, it was March 14th, Passion Sunday, but was read from the pulpit in Germany on Palm Sunday. And uh, adding a couple of uh, excerpts from this, he says a uh, very, very clear reference to Nazism, though without naming it, says, we thank you, venerable brethren, your priests and faithful, who have persisted in their Christian duty and in the defense of God's rights in the teeth of an aggressive paganism. That, that, is, that could not be a reference to anything else other than Nazism. Everybody knew exactly what he was talking about there. He talked about the, the fact that they were, the Nazis were m m very much into old pa pagan mythology and to pagan symbolism and so on and so forth. It was just thoroughly pagan. Uh, and uh, we quoted some of this yesterday. Yes, whoever wishes to see banished from church and school the biblical history and the wise doctrines of the Old Testament blasphemes the name of God, blasphemes the Almighty's plan of salvation, and makes limited and narrow human uh, limited and narrow human thought the judge of God's designs over the history of the world. Uh, he denies his faith in the, the true Christ, such as he appeared in the flesh, the Christ who took his human nature from a people that was to crucify him, and he understands nothing of that universal tragedy of the Son of God, who to his torturer's sacrilege opposed the divine and priestly sacrifice of his redeeming death, and made the new alliance the goal of the old alliance, its realization and its crown. So, uh, indeed, yes, uh, you have that to consider in, in the, the sacrifice of the cross, that on the part of those who put him to death, that was indeed the, put Christ to death, that was indeed the crime of deicide, the crime of killing God. Uh, they, you know, all those who were involved in that were indeed, uh, indeed guilty of that. St. Augustine talks about that. He says that, uh, it was, of course, it was Pilate who gave, Pontius Pilate who gave way to the pressure of the Jews to have him put to death, so uh, the Jews were more guilty. Uh, Pilate is still guilty, but it's just a question of who is guilty to what extent. So, indeed, on the part of those who put Christ to death, it was indeed the, the, uh, the horrible sacrilege of, of the crime of deicide on the part of Christ as, the, as both the priest and victim, the uh, sacrifice, which, of course, reopened uh, uh, heaven to mankind, uh, as it had been shut since Adam's commission of original sin. So he's saying this in a, uh, in a, well, in a, in a way that is uh, elegant enough to be befitting the, the papacy. Uh, however suspicious the intention of those who make it their task, nay, their vile profession, to scrutinize what is human in the church, and although the priestly powers conferred by God are independent of the priest's human value, Yet it remains true that at no moment of history, no individual and no organization can dispense himself from the duty of loyally examining his conscience, of mercilessly purifying himself, and energetically renewing himself in spirit and in action. And so he's saying really what we touched upon last time, which is that, of course, no, no sin of any member of the church could ever uh, affect the uh, the, the, the holiness of the church, the church will always remain holy whenever any individual members might do in their private lives, and that is also important in their lives as individuals, not as members of the, if they, if they are in fact hierarchy, as, uh, of the members of the hierarchy of the church, they are uh, of course the pope, protected by uh, infallibility, whether positive or negative, and we could get into that, or even the bishops. Uh, teaching union with the Pope, what are protected from leading the church into error, protected from leading souls, uh, the certainly the entire church, uh, to hell. Uh, but that does not prevent individual members from leading sinful, even highly scandalous lives personally, 
And that's exactly what he's saying here, that that can still cause great damage to the human element of the church. The, the failings of individual members can still cause that, and hence the obligation, on other, among other titles, of doing exactly this, of mercilessly purifying themselves. In our, in our encyclical on the priesthood, we have urged attention to the sacred duty of all those who belong to the church, chiefly the members of the priestly and religious profession and of the lay apostolate, to square their faith and their conduct with the claims of the law of God and of the church. And of course, there are all of the, the show trials of the clergy for immorality are still going on in Germany. And uh, well, that's definitely exaggerated, and it was definitely sensationalized for the purposes of the Third Reich and persecuting the church. No doubt there was some truth to some of it. And in any large organization, there's going to be some of that. Uh, uh, though, as we've said, uh, the, the Nazis were not exactly ones to appoint themselves uh, uh, the guardians of morality. They didn't exactly have much title to paint halos on themselves. <laughs> they were pretty disgusting uh, in their own lives. Uh, but they, they did object to certain types of immorality. They were definitely not, uh, as their own personal lives indicate and their own, their own policies indicate, were not opposed to immorality that was, we'll say, in accordance with nature. But they did object to unnatural immorality. But uh, still, uh, immorality, ultimately, uh, uh, those who uh, are engaged in, publicly in uh, grave offenses against the law of God ought not to be reprimanding others for uh, crimes of similar, if perhaps worse, nature. And today, we again repeat with the insistency, with all the insistency we can command, it is not enough to be a member of the Church of Christ. One needs to be a living member in spirit and in truth, that is, living in the state of grace and in the presence of God, either in innocence or in sincere repentance. So this, this distinction between living and dead members of the Church is that uh, uh, between someone, a member of the Church, who is in fact in the state of grace, and of course anyone who is in the state of grace is a member of the Church, but not every member of the church is in the state of grace. So we could go into uh, talk about for a long time who exactly qualifies as a member of the church. So in some cases, it's obvious those who are who are baptized Catholics and were never separated from the church, of course, are. But uh, going to different ways of being a member, that's that's not our focus right now. But even those who are members of the church, not all are in the state of grace. It is possible to commit a sin, a grave sin. Uh, without being cut off from the church. In fact, that's exactly the, uh, the, uh, what our Lord illustrates in the, the parable from this past Sunday, that of the man who comes to the, the wedding the banquet without his, without his wedding garment. That wedding garment indicates the virtue of charity, which necessarily accompanies the state of grace. Uh, so it, the, the point of that is that, in, yes, there, even in, in the church, as it is on earth, in the church militant, uh, there are those, there are some members who are displeasing to God because of having committed grave sins, and when they die, they will be cast out if they do not repent, uh, if they do not live in sincere repentance and return to innocence, as Pius XI is indicating here, they will be cut off from the church for eternity and cast out into the exterior darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is the meaning of this. this the, the parable from this past Sunday, which definitely applies here. So he's saying that those, in other words, those dead members of the church can still do great damage in their own lifetimes. They can still, they can still cause great problems for the church, such as is happening uh, in this case. So the encyclical was hard hitting. There's no doubt, but it could have been still harder. In other words, they did not denounce anybody by name or denounce any particular groups by name, even though it was it was clear who's being referred to, it still could have been harder. For months, the Holy Office had been working on a separate document offering a list of fundamental tenets of Nazism that the church condemned as grave errors. Among them were passages clearly taken from Hitler's Mein Kampf. So all of this indicates well, uh, a number of things, not only the points we've already talked about, 
but also uh, in illustrating uh, perhaps our most immediate point here, uh, Cardinal Pacelli's involvement in this was always one of pulling back, it was always one of seeking to make things nicer and, and in a sense diluted. But it also indicates that any accusations that the, the church was I, uh, in some way insufficient or uh, in its condemnations of the errors of Nazism, uh, that that is absurd. I mean, so this whole struggle going on and the persecution of the church resulting from those denunciations, you know, there can be no question that the church uh, had no use for Nazism as an ideology. And any, any kind of negotiations the church entered into with it, or, or for fa with fascism also for that matter, as a matter of forging an alliance with perhaps uh, the enemy of my enemy, uh, everybody recognized the danger of communism. There's no, there's no doubt of that. Everybody saw that as a threat. Everybody was terrified of the spread of communism. And anything that might stand in the way of it was seen as a, as a, as a help something that might be used anyway to some good effect, uh, but that the, the church does not approve of um, what, what these people are actually saying, that it's a, an, an alliance that uh, must be entered into for, to, to prevent greater evils, any kind of agreement, any kind of concordat, uh, and also because of the church's general policy of seeking to come to some kind of an arrangement with whatever the powers uh, that be are in any given nation, just to try to get the, allow the church to function normally. And that is always the case. We saw that in, in communist Russia where it ultimately didn't work out, but you see that everywhere. You know, however horrible the government might be, uh, the church is still willing to try to work out something with them, perhaps secretly without giving any kind of official recognition, but still willing to work out something perhaps through back channels uh, not, not all of those efforts are successful, but the church always seeks that. So worried that explicitly branding Nazi ideology non-Christian might lead Hitler to renounce the Concordat altogether, the Pope had decided on a less direct method of addressing it. Less direct. It was clear to everybody what was being said, but it was less direct this way. So he, the Pope, Pius XI, was not uh, only supported by Pacelli in this, but also by Cardinal Michael von Fallhaber, Archbishop of Munich, Germany's most important archdiocese. So one thing to keep in mind here that is that in, uh, in arranging dioceses and in uh, putting together a, a hierarchy among dioceses, that the church looks first at where the greatest concentrations of Catholic population are, not necessarily where the political capital is. They might, you might not have many Catholics for whatever reason <clears throat> living in the capital city of a nation or the, most, or the, the largest city in any given area uh, for, for any number of reasons. Uh, the Catholic population may just not have taken root there, but instead looks at where the, uh, the largest numbers of Catholics are. So Munich, capital of Bavaria, largest uh, number of Catholics in, in Bavaria, Therefore, the church sets up uh, uh, Munich as the number one uh, diocese within our archdiocese within Germany. Yes. Is this document separate from the encyclical? The yes. Encyclical? In fact, it was. It wasn't even published. Was it read with the? Um, no, it was not. Encyclical? It was not. No, it was. It was prepared. It was put together, but it was not published together with it. And that was that was considered to be one step too hard. Uh, that would that would have been a little too much. For not in itself, but for, uh, but for Hitler to to take without rejecting, as they were concerned about the Concordat altogether. So clearly, Pius XI had no problem with the idea of condemning Nazism, but uh, decided not to be as hard as he could have at the urging of Cardinal Pacelli, notably, but others as well, to the effect that we can't be so hard; otherwise, it will destroy everything we've accomplished up until now. Still, Hitler was furious, outraged not only by the public nature of the encyclical, but also by the Pope's ability to have the message distributed so widely without his knowledge. So remember, that was the original idea of an encyclical, a way to uh, get the word out without having to uh, seek the cooperation or the lack of cooperation or having to deal with it, deal with the obstacles that the civil power might put in the way of the publication of a papal bull. 
because there's absolutely no way Hitler would have cooperated in a, den a denunciation of his own system uh, in Germany. There's no way that would have happened. But he was still infuriated by this. He ordered the police to close down the Catholic publishing houses and sent agents to diocesan headquarters and monasteries throughout the country to seize their files. I will heap disgrace and shame on the Catholic Church, he told one visitor, opening unknown monastic archives and having the filth contained in them published. That was his plan. He threatened to reveal graphic details of sexual abuse by the Catholic clergy and moved quickly to gather incriminating evidence. When word of the police raids got out, the Bishop of Berlin and the Archbishop of Breslau ordered all the files dealing with complaints against priests to be burned because they were going to be put to use just to, really just to persecute the church. Um, they, yeah, clearly yeah, the Nazis have no particular love for morality and they are just uh, they're seeking a hammer with which to, to, to do damage to the church. So the, perp the Pope urged all of Germany's bishops to follow their example. So don't, don't give them anything to work with. In late May 1937, uh, 500 Chicago priests gathered at a local seminary, as they did four times a year, to attend their diocesan conference. So, you know, so in the midst of all of this, uh, we're focusing heavily on Europe. There's relatively little to say about what's going on in the United States. Uh, it's not to say that everything is perfect in the United States. The situation, which we've touched upon previously, that of separation of church and state, which existed from the beginning in the United States, uh, is, is problematic, is disordered in itself, but it was actually respected in the sense that uh, church and state were actually separated, uh, as opposed to uh, Western Europe where, you know, theoretically, church and state are separated, but there's still enough, there's still something there. Uh, the, church, the state still recognizes the church to a degree, just enough to give it trouble, but the state still recognizes the church to a degree. So to this day in, 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 in Western Europe, this exists. Uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the Italian Institute, they have to register as, uh, well, for tax purposes, they, they cannot register as a, 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 a any kind of a religious organization, as a, certainly not as a Novus Ordo, as a Catholic organization, because they would have to be, uh, that requires some, some kind of recognition by the Novus Ordo, which of course they don't have. Uh, so they, to, but to register as some kind of a religious organization, as I understand that, I don't know all the legal details of it, but my understanding is that they cannot register as any kind of religious organization and get the, the, the whatever tax benefits that might come from that or, or anything else, because that would require, they can't get, they cannot be registered as a Catholic organization, but they also cannot be registered as, they will not obviously sign up to be some kind of a, uh, Protestant sect or something like that, so they have to, they, I don't know how they manage it, but somehow they, uh, they, they manage to be recognized by the state, but uh, not as a religious organization. According to my understanding, you'd have to ask them to, uh, for all the details of that, if they'd be willing to provide it, but that is the case, because still in, in Western Europe, there's still some recognition there, yeah, not enough to give the church trouble, and that, that's about it. Whereas uh, here in the U.S., that the state just never really, truly never recognized the church. Um, the uh, stated religious indifferentism of this nation, which is problematic, that's bad, uh, has in fact always existed and actually been uh, maintained, I'll say consistently. Uh, it's not really to the credit of the nation, but it is uh, because that's a bad thing in itself, but it, it's consistent and paracidens is a good thing. It's an accidental good effect of that that the church has always been free to operate uh, in the United States without any kind of hindrance. Without any support, the, church, uh, the state ought to be supporting the church, and that has never been the case here. The government has never supported the Catholic Church, uh, but it has never hindered it either. So that's why there's relatively little to say about what's going on in uh, what's, what's happening with the church in, in the United States at this point. But it was, to a, great, to a great extent, flourishing. Certainly in, no, in terms of numbers, uh, large parishes everywhere. Uh, and in fact, it, in canon law, uh, there, are, there are provisions against 
establishing parishes purely on the basis of different languages or, or different ethnicities. But exceptions were made to that, if you read the, the commentators on it, exceptions were made to that uh, in the United States because uh, in the cities, it, this is our, well, okay, pre, pre-World War II, pre uh, prosperity boom that followed World War II and the and the explosion of s- suburbs in the wake of that. Uh, we're looking at times in which everybody still lived in the cities, and you had um, all these uh, fairly densely populated cities, everybody living in the cities, and uh, the church is just uh, a short walk away from everyone's houses, all, all the Catholics in the city. So you might have multiple churches on the same street, and the Italians living there might go to one, the Germans going to another, the Irish to another, the Poles to another, and all these people living in close proximity to one another, all with very, very different backgrounds, uh, and all of them, therefore, uh, with, with very different customs when it comes to practicing the faith. And so what the, the Irish always like to go to low masses and say their rosaries because that's, what, that's all they knew from centuries of, of persecution, uh, Protestant English persecution. That's all they knew, and that, that, those, that became their custom. In fact, it even became a custom among the Irish to uh, the elevation of the host to look down instead of up at it. And that, that was a custom that originated in the persecutions because that meant that when they, any day they managed to get to Mass, if they looked down instead of up at the host, they could, they could tell the, the English police, truthfully, that they had not seen the host that day. Strictly speaking, true, an example of, uh, of, uh, of mental reservation, absolutely, uh, about taking that to its limits, but, but the truth they could say it, truthfully, that they had not seen the host that day because they had not looked up at the elevation. They'd been to Mass, which was forbidden, but they had not actually looked at the host, so they could say that, and that was, uh, you know, I imagine the, the police may have caught on after a while, uh, that's what was going on, but at least for a time that worked, um, or probably would have, I don't know any particular instances of what happened on those occasions, but the, the, uh, they, it's heavily suggested that that uh, satisfied the police and, they, okay, you haven't been to Mass today, we'll, we'll leave you alone. So that, that background, for example, was uh, very much, uh, had an influence on the huge numbers of Irish who emigrated to the United States for in the mid-19th century. Starting then, there was a huge uh, exodus from, from Ireland. In fact, Ireland took a tremendous population hit in the mid-19th century because of the uh, potato famine, the famous Irish potato famine. They relied, the population of Ireland being very largely poor, relied heavily on potatoes. And when that failed, there was a huge famine. Many, many people died. Many others left the country as a result, in fact, population of Ireland has still not recovered from that. Uh, it still has, it's not what it was pre-potato famine. Uh, there are other reasons for that. They're not exactly helping it now. Ireland is, generally speaking, very pro-abortion at this point, so they're not exactly helping their problem. Uh, so, but uh, uh, it's the, fact, the fact remains that it still has not recovered from that. And large, very large, large numbers of Irish came over. Many from other nations came over as well all with very different backgrounds. So uh, Germans or Italians might like big, much bigger ceremonies, and therefore probably the Irish would not be too happy if they had to go to uh, uh, a church where the, the mass, uh, uh, at least one of the, the masses that day, uh, which were always, uh, at this point, masses were, uh, they have parishes of many different masses every Sundays because of the large numbers. If one of those masses available to them, to which they might have to go sometimes, was a was a high mass, they might not like that too much, or big processions, the Irish would not have liked that so much, whereas if the Germans or Italians may have liked that quite a bit. So you had uh, all these different parishes, therefore, set up in cities in the United States uh, along lines of language and, and ethnicity and so forth, which ordinarily is not supposed to be done, but also keep in mind that uh, canon law, in a sense, was written with uh, Western Europe in mind, in which you had typically a monastery or a parish church around which the, the village was built. Okay, that is the parish church for that village, and we're not going to draw parish lines along anything else. Whereas the circumstances in the U.S. were very different. So, this is, you know, so despite a lack of focus on what's happening in the U.S. at this time, we shouldn't 
uh, draw from that the conclusion that the church is inactive here or that nothing is going on, that the church is not conducti conducting any kind of apostolate. Quite the opposite. Uh, in fact, the, in, in certain ways, the church is flourishing. Uh, that's saying not without problems. We saw the problems of Americanism. Um, that, that, was, that, that came to the forefront during the reign of Leo XIII, which we studied last year, and we're not going to get into it now. But things are, are uh, there, there is uh, an apostolate ongoing, there, are, uh, there, there is a definite strain of liberalism, uh, but generally speaking, things are under control. Definitely the, the church does not have to, is not, is not engaging in these epic battles with the United States government <laughs> the way it is struggling with the governments of, of uh, different nations in Europe. So in May 1937, at 500 priests of the Diocese of Chicago gathered at the local seminary uh, for their uh, four times a year diocesan conference. Uh, when Archbishop George Mundelein rose to speak, there was no indication that he, what he would say would be of any interest outside Chicago. And his remarks would trigger an international cause célèbre. So, a uh, French term, uh, uh, this, was, this became a, a high-profile um, high, high profile crisis in this case. Uh, did not, for some reason, he decided to denounce the Nazis in his, in his speech, um, not without reason, but... Uh, We'll see what he said, and that, that this caused a bit of an explosion. Denouncing a Nazi regime for its persecution of the church, he told his priests, perhaps you will ask how it is that a nation of 60 million intelligent people will submit in fear and servitude to an alien, an Austrian paper hanger, and a poor one at that, and a few associates like Goebbels and Goering, who dictate every move of the people's lives. So... <laughs> Uh, quite the uh, quite quite the scorching denunciation there, and that's true. That uh, Hitler was uh, an Austrian of of rather humble beginnings. There's no denying that. Yeah, remember he was a uh, reject of the Austrian army. Ended up joining the Germans because they were more willing to do uh, to avail themselves of whatever manpower there was. So this uh, these remarks uh, caused outrage among the Nazis, and the German government demanded an apology from the Vatican. Cardinal Pacelli, replying on behalf of the Pope, refused. Uh, no such apology could be considered, he said, unless the German government first ordered a stop to the stream of attacks on the church in Germany's newspapers. So that's ongoing. Remember all of the sensational, this, the making sensational of all of the uh, uh, show trials of the clergy. Uh, Berlin recalled Diego von Bergen, Germany's ambassador to the Holy See. So whenever you see that, an ambassador being recalled, that's a sign, well, usually among nations, that's a sign of war about to break out. Uh, not, that, um, not that the Holy See, not that there are any papal armies left by this point, but that's a definite sign of some kind of a break. Now, previously, there were papal armies, which didn't always, didn't do so well generally on the battlefield, but there were such things as papal armies. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, th there are none. But... Uh, this is still, it's a sign that this is a real displeasure on the part of the German government that uh, the Vatican is not, not going to apologize for these, uh, these remarks made by Archbishop Mundelein. So the Spanish Civil War threatened to, all this is going on, the Spanish Civil War is ongoing. Remember that lasted from 1936 to 1939. Uh, the Spanish Civil War threatened to drag Europe into a larger conflagration. Remember, uh, we saw Mussolini sent troops, uh, black-shirted troops. They were not in there in any kind of official capacity, uh, but they were definitely there. Also, Hitler similarly sent about 10,000 troops to support uh, Franco's uprising. In August, Italian submarines began sinking ships bound for Republican-controlled Spanish ports, while Hitler accelerated Germany's rearmament. So this very much fed into what was to come just a few years later. Through it all, the Pope continued to press Mussolini to help him with Hitler. So that was one of the reasons why uh, Pius XI sought to come to an understanding with Mussolini, which we saw earlier, that was accomplished years ago by this point, but that's why he wanted to have some kind of, uh, to come to terms with him so that he could use him and to an extent, you know, he, he, 
Pi 11 was under no uh, illusions that it was possible, humanly speaking, to make Mussolini into any kind of a, a Christian, into any kind of a good Catholic, certainly. Remember, he uh, in his early career that uh, Mussolini had to declare himself an atheist and demanded that uh, God strike him dead within a, within a certain amount of time. And when it didn't happen, he just, he uh, denounce uh, ever or more ever more vigorously the idea of the existence of God. So, uh, Mussolini was uh, was uh, was always was always horrible, and he had a member over a hundred mistresses. He was just a disgusting human being. But uh, Pius XI still wanted to come to an understanding with him, t in order to 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 put him at the service of the Church to whatever extent was possible. Not that Mussolini would ever agree to assist the church faithfully, but he could uh, make use of him somehow. I uh, remember we saw that he really, he buttered up Mussolini quite a bit, gave him, uh, gave him honors and, and, and spoke highly of him, d to a, uh, you know, said highly of him whatever things, nice things could be said of him, let's put it that way. Uh, and you see at this point he's attempting to make use of Mussolini again, trying to uh, make use of really understanding that Mussolini was Hitler's idol, even literally, uh, had a bust of him on his desk, whereas Mussolini had a bust of Napoleon on his desk. You see what they're all looking at, ultimately it's all to the, all to the revolution, they're all a bunch of leftist revolutionaries here, uh, but he still sees, okay, we can try to get Mussolini to, uh, to intervene with, uh, on, on our behalf with Hitler here. So the Duce's interest in dampening tensions between the Pope and the German dictator was clear. Were the Pope to denounce the Nazis and excommunicate Hitler, it would be impossible to persuade Italians to tie their fate to the Third Reich. And uh, indeed, we saw that uh, Mussolini became increasingly reliant uh, on, on, on Hitler and on, Germany, on Germany's capacity for everything in general. Uh, in order to keep himself afloat. And that would be, as, as the Second World War commenced and progressed, that became ever more true, uh, ever truer. Uh, it was in order to save Mussolini's uh, uh, botched uh, wars in Africa that Hitler sent Rommel there to begin with. Uh, so the, uh, remember, we talked about the, uh, Mussolini's invasion of, of Ethiopia or Abyssinia uh, and the fact that the League of Nations could do absolutely nothing about it. The, the emperor of Abyssinia actually went to the League of Nations and got them to condemn Mussolini's invasion, but Mussolini absolutely could not have cared less about it. He just continued. He actually, actually ended up conquering that territory. Uh, but as he continued, and he continued to remember, his idea was to rebuild the Roman Empire in Africa. Uh, it's true that the Roman Empire had certain possessions in Africa, but uh, that, was, uh, that, was, that was not the extent of it, but that was his idea. We'll just, we'll re we'll, a new Italian empire uh, extending south into Africa. He, he decided to then start attacking British domains, and the, uh, the British started beating him back, and things started falling apart. And then he asked Hitler for help. Hitler went in, and then uh, things escalated from there. Uh, but that was all to support. Uh, that was all to support his idol, Hitler's idol, Mussolini, getting into trouble. So, uh, and, and Mussolini realizes that he needs this uh, support of Hitler. And so, at this point, what that translates into is in a, his uh, having himself an interest in in bringing down tensions between the Holy See and Germany. Say, were the Pope to denounce the Nazis and excommunicate Hitler, Italians would uh, uh, be less willing to become involved with, with Hitler and the Germans. In 1938, uh, Mussolini reported to the Pope on his latest efforts, taking credit in March of that year for the Nazis' recent suspension of the embarrassing show trials of the Catholic clergy. So they're willing to suspend those trials, <laughs> notice that, uh, when it's convenient. So it's it's clearly not from a, a genuine interest in preserving the morality of the, uh, uh, either of the clergy or of the youth of the nation. It's something they're willing to suspend when it's convenient. But over the previous two years, hundreds of priests and monks had nevertheless been jailed, charged with committing crimes against young boys. 
these immorality trials generated huge press coverage. Goebbels, in a nationwide radio speech, charged that the sacristy has become a bordello while the monasteries are breeding places of vile homosexuality. So uh, one thing, that's obviously an exaggeration. <laughs> obviously. That, that, was the, that was not true across the board, of course not. Uh, though there may have been, unfortunately, some of that, uh, some, uh, some grave sins committed by the clergy, by religious, along those lines, definitely it's an exaggeration. And, well, Goebbels' personal life was not exactly well, that of someone uh, you would canonize. So, without going into that, uh, you'd see, you do see also that the, the, the Nazis did uh, oppose unnatural vice. They were opposed to that. In fact, uh, at the time, uh, as I had been for a long time, inclinations to unnatural vice was deemed uh, a mental illness. Uh, and uh, let's see. you see the reasons for that. Uh, the Pope thanked Mussolini for his efforts, but added that if normal relations were to be restored between the Vatican and the Third Reich, he would have to persuade Hitler to allow Catholic schools and Catholic action groups to function freely again. So now we're here really, really addressing problems with the, that existed in the Concordat uh, between the, the Vatican and, and, the, and the Nazi regime to begin with, that they left all of that vague, or certainly the school aspect vague. So, uh, moving on to just trying to uh, get through some of this here. In June of 1938, uh, an American Jesuit priest visiting Rome at the time, Father John Lafarge, received a message that the Pope wanted to see him at Castel Gondolfo. The Pope told uh, Father Lafarge that he wanted him to prepare an encyclical on the problem of racism. The Pope told him that uh, the Pope told him to take it up with his Jesuit Superior General, Father Lederhovsky who, when he heard of the project, said, the Pope is mad. In other words, why is he doing this? You see what's going on? Well, uh, we, we saw this last year. This is, this, is a, uh, this, is, this is actually taken from some of the material that we covered last year on Pius XI. But you know, we're looking at it here. Um, we're not going to, in, to go into nearly as much detail as we did last year. But we're looking here mainly at the, the influence that Cardinal Pacelli is constantly seeking to exert. and, and uh, uh, actually, on the one hand, he had, clearly had a very good sense, uh, given his training in diplomacy, which is really not a surprise, but he had a very good sense of how people would react to different things. Usually, he says, uh, if, if we do this or that, the reaction will be bad, and his advice is set aside, the reaction usually is bad. So he actually does have a very good sense of these things. It's just that sometimes bad people will react badly to things that need to be done. <laughs> So it's not the diplomatic course, he, even when correctly assessed as being the one that will not make people upset, is not necessarily the correct one. But you know, that's his training, that's Pacelli's training, and that's always the, the angle that, from which he looks at things. How can we maintain diplomatic relations, or perhaps improve them, as the case may be? So here, uh, the idea is if you, if you publish an encyclical on racism, this will cause a, a uh, it hadn't been invented yet, but a nuclear blast. <laughs> so Litohovsky gave him two other Jesuits to help him. Uh, other, over, the, uh, see, over the summer, they worked on the encyclical, which would have been known, uh, or would be known as Umani Generis Unitas. Mussolini, at this time, was prepared to enact racial laws, among which would be to prohibit Jews from marrying Italians, even those who had converted to the Catholic faith. So you may, you may remember from last year that uh, the definition of a Jew, as far as Mussolini was concerned, was somebody born of parents of the Jewish race. Uh, remember that the church opposes Judaism on the basis of religion, not race. And um, uh, the, of course, the, the church, in fact, uh, quite, quite the opposite, as far as race goes, prays for the conversion of the Jews, which will eventually happen as a nation, not just in some numbers, but as a nation. That will eventually happen. And uh, the church prays for that you know, every Good Friday, not genuflect traditionally in the, in the traditional Holy Week and not genuflecting at that prayer. But the church prays for the conversion of the Jews every single Good Friday, very publicly. Uh, and uh, clearly, therefore, does not consider them to be uh, subhuman or something like that. And uh, uh, not, not to be lacking human souls or anything of that nature. Uh, 
uh, however much, and keep it, and this is true despite the fact that the church has suffered persecution from the Jews uh, really throughout history, throughout the entire history of the church. The church has been persecuted by the Jews, which is not something you hear too much about. Most of the persecution of the early church you hear of is on the part of the, of the pagan Roman Empire, but there was persecution by the Jews, which was particularly brutal. Even from the very, from the very foundation of the church, very uh, St. Paul, uh, obviously, before his conversion, persecuting the church and getting permission to expand that persecution. That was, uh, and, uh, the Jews have persecuted the church, but never, nevertheless, the church still seeks their conversion and does everything, does everything possible to procure it, uh, prays for it regularly and publicly, and when they, in, any, in any instances of conversion, which are relatively few, the church always receives them as, as, as any other member of the church, anyone else being received into the church. And recognizing that it is a difficult thing for them to do because for them it's tied up. It's, 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 today, certainly, it's become a nationalistic thing, that Jews really are members of two different nations, the nations in which they live and also a member of the Jewish nation. And to, to abandon the false religion uh, of Judaism, uh, which it, certainly it is now, is a false religion, in order to abandon that false religion and embrace the faith, they have to give up the nationalistic aspect of it, they have, which includes walking away from their families. You may remember the case of the Mortara affair, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Edgardo Mortara, having been baptized by a Catholic uh, ser a servant girl in his family's house, had to be taken away. It was in the time of the Papal States, but was taken out of his family's home and said as himself growing up, uh, he became a priest ultimately, but he said that uh, the only thing he could possibly, the only explanation he could possibly put forth for how he did not choose to go back to his Jewish family was grace. You know, it was the, uh, the, the influ due to the influence of grace. Uh, he could not come up with any other explanation. That is it, grace. Uh, and remember, he, he, he geared his own apostolate to converting the Jews, which did not result in large numbers of conversions, because that they're, it's difficult to do that. But the point is that the, the church uh, receives converts, uh, the few that there are, uh, the con converts from Judaism, just as converts from any other false religion. So the uh, last provision of this uh, irritated the Pope a great deal. So the idea is we don't want Jews marrying any, any, uh, any, uh, any Italians, and this means even Jews who have converted to the Catholic faith. This is a racial definition of Jews, and the, the church does not oppose them on that basis. The Pope, in the meantime, continued to attack the racial laws that were being discussed and contemplated. So Mussolini was sending clear signal, had passed certain laws, was, was clearly thinking of passing others, and Pius XI opposes that. In a speech to 200 students in the Propaganda College, he said that there was only one big human race, and then added, one can ask how it is that Italy, unfortunately, felt the need to go and imitate Germany. So we're saying um, Hitler is, is, um, is, is on fire with all of his rhetoric of the uh, superior race and all of that, and clearly Italy is following to an extent here. In August of 1938, the Italian government issued a series of anti-Semitic laws. On August 4th of 1938, Pius XI summoned Giovanni Battisti, Battista Montini. He had rehabilitated Montini in 1937 and made him one of Pacelli's two undersecretaries. So, Giovanni Battista Montini, future Paul VI, uh, who is uh, a communist. And, uh, uh, but is coming up through the ranks even, say, during the reign of Pius XI, we're seeing that right now, but working closely with Pacelli, who, as Pius XII would make him Archbishop of Milan, uh, which is, in a sense, if there is a, if there's a direct path to the papacy, it, it's, it begins in the Archdiocese of Milan. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the idea was, uh, it's difficult to know what exactly was going through the mind of Pius XII, but uh, the idea was, uh, there was a certain punishment involved in that, and that was that he wasn't made a cardinal. He, he, he put Montini in Milan, and the Archbishop of Milan is always a cardinal. Uh, but he was, he was put there and not made a cardinal. And that was considered to God, uh, that, that was his slap on the wrist, given the biggest diocese in the world. <laughs> but uh, not an, he's not made a cardinal, so that's his punishment. 
And that's the way that we'll see that Pius XII would punish people. It was, uh, it was, it was uh, not, not so very harsh, to say the least. But here, we see, well, we'll, we'll go into this uh, next time. Uh, we'll go more into uh, pa Cardinal Pacelli and his involvement in this, uh, in Pius XI's reactions to uh, racial laws in Italy. Uh, but one thing to note here is that Montini is being rehabilitated and uh, that he's working with Pacelli. So we'll continue with that next time.